But first, I'm joined uh, by Mike Jempson from the Campaign for Press and Broadcasting Freedom. Mike, you also set up a charity here in the city. Um, can you tell us about some of the early days of this campaign? I think it's 40 years old, isn't it? It'll be 40 years old next year. It was started in 1978 during the winter of discontent, as it was lovingly called by the Daily Mirror, um, at a time when um, the unions and progressive activists were getting a pretty hard time from the, from the mainstream press, um, not to mention the Labour Party. And um, there was a lot of anxiety amongst uh, print workers and journalists about what was happening. And so the campaign, which was originally called the Campaign for Press Freedom, was set up by a group of journalists and academics um, and trade union activists. And by the way, it's not sort of closing down. It, that's certainly not by choice. I mean, the big reason for that is the lack of funding. Um, and uh, so much has changed, which we perhaps can go into. But uh, although we just do not have the money to carry on, to sustain an office and staff, um, the campaigning will continue, but in other forms. Uh, but the winter of discontent, I mean, certainly the way most people look back on it now is that this was really the o unions overstretching themselves, causing so much trouble that they ended up being hated more than the government was back at the end, the end of the 70s. Well, it depends who you're talking to, I think. I mean, you'll find that... Um, uh, one of the big problems was their uh, their causes were being so poorly represented. And, of course, at the time, uh, unions were not very good at handling the media themselves, so it was always an afterthought. Um, and things did get out of hand, it's true, and it was a difficult period. In fact, I was a, a young journalist at the time, and we were on strike throughout the winter of 1978 um, because our employers, we then had a national wage agreement, as did many unions, and our employers, the Newspaper Publishers Association, were not willing to negotiate. Um, so we weren't the only ones. There were public se sector workers um, on strike as well, um, and uh, things did get very unpleasant. Um, and, of course, it's always the unions that get the blame. The union was on strike for how long were you on strike for then? The NUJ members were on strike, I think, for seven weeks, if I remember rightly. So that means no news, does it, uh, in, in various outlets? What this, was the, this, was, uh, this was national, a national strike of provincial newspapers, so it was the local press that was on strike. Some of the publications still came out rather thinly, run by their managements um, and some scab labour. But for the most part, um, they weren't being published. We, were, we, for instance, in East London, were publishing our own little newsletter. And subsequently, uh, we set up a thing called East End News as a cooperative venture to provide an alternative view of what was happening in East London at the time. Now, the 1970s were a very different time because it was really the 80s that the technology changed and uh, we started getting digital printing, that sort of thing, with, with, particularly with Rupert Murdoch sort of leading the way. What was the relationship like between the journalist unions and the print unions back in the 70s? Well, it, of course, it was Eddie Shah who was used to launch a newspaper today using the new technology. And, of course, one of the big problems was that journalists were used. There was a whole process which involved a variety of different print unions in, in producing newspapers at the time. And a lot of employers, for instance, were not very keen on bringing computers into the newsroom. I started out on a, on a typewriter and it took a very long time for computers to come into the newsroom. And then you had the problem that you were able to produce copy which didn't need to be reset by the printers. Um, and what happened was the initial antipathy between the two groups of workers um, was resolved by a lot of very difficult negotiation, which included the idea of merger. And quite a few print workers actually, including some who are very active in the campaign, became um, journalists too. So the, the difference in the technique, what was it between the hot metal days and the somehow somehow a journalist types something and then it automatically gets put onto... Uh, well, gra gradually you reach the, the point where, um, as now, I mean, I, I was, for instance, producing community newspapers and indeed the Campaign for Press Freedom's newsletter for three years 
cutting and pasting type material on my kitchen table um, and then that would go off to be photographed and then made into plates so it was a very very different style of working to what you have now with with sort of um, uh, systems within newspapers which are like a, a sort of formulaic way of producing a, a page what it looks like how many words you're going to get on that page whereas when I started out you had to know the width of each letter especially when ma making up headlines um, and it was you know the, the skill set you needed was very very different when the campaign for press and broadcast freedom first started, what was your? Do you have any any specific aim? Do you have any something particularly in mind to, to try and achieve? There were a series of very important issues which remain um, just as apposite now. One of them was about plurality, the need for a variety of different types of publication and different systems of ownership, as well as different owners, because even. Uh, even then, there was uh, a very limited range of owners of a very limited range of, if you like, political views in the mainstream press, uh, most of whom were opposed to the Labour Party and the Labour movement in particular. So that was one thing, the whole issue of ownership and control. And another was the right of reply, because in those days you had particularly when you're talking about industrial disputes or progressive movements like CND, for instance, uh, and peace, peace movements, you'd get very, very negative coverage, and there was no guarantee that people would be asked for their point of view. Um, the same was true, too, about reporting on ethnic minorities. So newspapers are quite happy to produce what we would now consider to be racist copy and never think about asking black people or gypsies, for instance, what their point of view was. So we, uh, one of the big issues for the campaign was to get a statutory right of reply. And I think it's worth pointing out that, for instance, in France and Belgium, there's been a, a right of reply, if a newspaper gets things wrong, since the 19th century. And most European countries have got a right of reply, so that if a newspaper gets things wrong, they're expected to allow the person who they've misrepresented to give their point of view soon afterwards. Um, and the campaign has written and developed a whole series, I think five, altogether five different bills to try and get a statutory right of reply in this country. But no success? No, they've had all party support, but they've been attacked, of course, by the, the mainstream press um, throughout, and none have got beyond a second reading. Um, I was particularly involved with... Uh, well, the first one was with Frank Alorn in about 1983, 84, and then you had Tony Worthington, you had Anne Cluid, um, later you had Peter Bradley and, uh, and Austin Mitchell. But the bill I got most involved with was Clive Soley's Press Freedom and Responsibility Bill. And we organised in Parliament um, a sp special hearings where members of the public who'd been trounced by the press and the regulator then, the Press Complaints Commission, and the print unions um, were invited to come and talk through some of the issues. It was a very unusual um, uh, proceeding. The bill, however, uh, fell at the second reading, as it usually does in these cases. And we then gathered 70 different people and organisations who'd had a hard time from the press in Parliament, and they were invited, or the press were invited to meet them. Not a single journalist turned up. So the people present then got very angry, and they came up with ideas for an organisation to take the place of the body that Clive Soley had been proposing, and that's how press-wise, now media-wise, got started very frustrating isn't it uh, it seems that the press have got something they want to tell people they don't always want to listen well I mean it, it's these things these are difficult things especially nowadays when everybody sort of shouts and hollers about fake news most of the stuff in newspapers is not fake news there is stuff which I've been exposing through media wise for many years now which is not complete or which is deliberately misdirecting people um but it's interesting that, that for all the fact that I've spent much of my career criticising the media, 
my colleagues in the NUJ have r recognised how valuable this sort of work is, um, and I've been I've been awarded um, a gold medal by the union and in fact a life membership now for the work that I've done on trying to promote journalistic ethics because most journalists want to be able to tell the truth and not to be subjected to the sorts of pressure that often happens in national newspaper newsrooms. I mean, we're talking about the old hot metal days and also, of course, the ownership here of the Bristol Post used to be locally owned. In fact, it was set up originally to be a locally owned newspaper, wasn't it? Well, most were. I mean, in fact, in the, in the 1920s, um, when there were all sorts of problems, as you know, in, in terms of the economy, uh, what you got was a sort of gentleman's agreement between the various different, mostly family firms that ran local papers. And I think there were two or three in Bristol then. Um, they sort of agreed that we'll, everybody would have a town each. And that's how we got um, the evening post as it is now. Now, the ironical thing is that when, at the time the campaign started, the evening post was one of the best local papers to work for. It had very good reputation, it had excellent wages, had a lot of staff. It was the sort of paper people wanted to be on. Um, sadly, that's no longer the case. What's changed? Well, ownership Other for a start. Ownership. I mean, ownership has it's changed hands several times. It's gone over to um, Daily Mail, first of all, and then yeah. now to um, And now Trinity to the Mirror Mail. Group, Trinity. Well, that's changed its name too now. Um, and it had, at one time... Interestingly, with the same, edi same editor. Yeah, from, yeah. From, the, from Northcliffe, which is the Daily Mail, to the Mirror, you'd expect that there'd be a change of editor. No. No. Um, uh, newspaper owners um, employ the editors they think will do their whim. Um, and once upon a time, the Evening Post, for instance, had a former Guardian associate editor as its editor and was a very um, feature-full newspaper. Um, so lots of in-depth stuff and longer pieces of journalism. They then hired a, a tabloid editor who completely transformed the paper and in doing so, very interestingly, expanded the readership. Um, so it became a much more popular paper, and that's a good thing. Um, but it also became very formulaic, and it lost, they got rid of all the feature writers. And now you get very little coverage of the local authority, for instance. Um, there isn't the, enough staff to do things in depth. And so the Evening Post now has had to rely on what are called the democracy reporters, paid for by the BBC out of our... Um, uh, license fee payers money. Well, it's interesting, we still call it the Evening Post, don't we? That's actually the Bristol Post. It stopped being an evening paper for quite a while ago, but that... Well, yes, once it was had three issues a day and several on Saturday and the pink and the, and the green and etc. Yeah, it's a very changed beast. Somebody that worked in the uh, early days of the Post, when it was uh, still hot metal, uh, that is to say a, a, a very... A different style of print room where individual compositors would make up the uh, printing blocks from little bits of metal um, that is to say with, a, with letters on them they would make up the stories uh, one of the people that used to work there was a chap called Dennis Pater and I spoke to him a few uh, years ago uh, as part of something called the National Union of Journalists uh, Oral History Project and here he is just giving us a flavour of what life was like back before they went over to the, the digital press for a whole generation uh, now, they have only known the Evening Post and Western Daily Press to be up at Temple Way. Um, whereabouts was it in Broadmead? Um, opposite the Odeon, if it, down the bottom of the hill there. Um, and in fact, the, the building as such is still there, opposite the fire station next to the Bridewell Police Station. The building is still there with um, shops on the ground floor level and um, offices above. So, the, so um, they've utilised the building. Well, and um, now, most of us know what a modern newsroom looks like. Mm -hmm. Give us a—I mean, you've already told us a little bit—but give us a sort of sweep round the newsroom in those days. Maybe the, talking about the 1960s, I yes. guess. Well, certainly from um, the um, journalist point of view, they all seem to be huddled together in very small rooms, um, with banks of paper on spikes everywhere, and cluttered desks of newspapers and paper, and. Uh, 
typewriters uh, clattering away and uh, all the guys seemed to uh, be smoking in those days and uh, ties undone around their waist. Some guys would wear the, the, the visor shades like you see in some of these films. And, um, but there was a great atmosphere. And in the composing room, again, it was very noisy with, with, the, with the hot metal. And on audition time, um, a journalist, a sub, would come down to the composing room to sub the page a great big hot metal page and he'd stand on what was called the stone the other side of the stone from the compositor and um, he would um, instruct the compositor what changes he'd made he, he'd have his galley proofs as they were called that were um, that were pulled and um, inked up the type and pulled so that the journalist had his galley proof to make his um, late corrections sometimes there wasn't time for all the corrections to go they had to go without them but um, in the, in the old days there was the the barrier where um, the NGA wouldn't let anybody else touch the type and um, that applied to the journalists as well and one former editor of the Evening Post who will remain nameless showed me a, a permanent dent he had on the back of his hand where one day he went to touch the type and he was warned not to and a few minutes later he did touch the type and he was hit on the back of the hand with a, with a wooden mallet so, uh, so you know the demarcation was it was very strict in those days. Now, as someone who's been working here as well recently, you talked about the atmosphere in the old paper. How has the atmosphere changed over the years? Well, um, it very much seems library-like to me now. It's very quiet, unless um, a, a really big news story breaks. Very quiet. But what interests me, Mike, is this uh, whole idea of the editor not actually getting involved, that really the journalist and... Uh, the compositor there are the only two people who are involved in writing that story. Nowadays, the journalist will press the button and anything could happen to that story. It can be edited, it can be subbed and changed before it actually reaches the newspaper. No, I think we haven't got, got that quite right. In fact, at the time that uh, being talked about there, you'd also have a reader. So once the stuff had been typed up um, and set and the galley proof had been produced, which was like a sort of rough print... Um, you'd have a reader who was not a journalist, who was one of the print unions, who would sort of check it for obvious spelling errors, etc., and might draw attention to those. And then you'd have a sub who'd go down and point out that this and that had to be changed. But, I mean, the editor had overall charge and would normally have passed either him or one of his uh, deputies, now mostly men, would have passed the proofs down um, to be to be published. I think one of the sad things about here in Bristol is that the old print room, or the new print room if you like, um, down um, at the post buildings has now gone. That's a temporary and it's, yes, and it's, the yeah, on the, uh, yes, it's now office blocks and it shows you know, what the real interests of these huge corporations that own the media are really interested in. I mean, they're vast corporations who have lots of other interests, some of which one could say, and this was one of the main points of the campaign, um, was that, you know, that might actually interfere with the nature of the coverage that they might give. So, for instance, if I own a newspaper, and I also own forests, um, uh, oil-producing pr um, uh, <coughs> my, uh, you know, oil fields. <laughs> oil fields. Yeah. Sorry, um, transport systems, maybe even hotel systems. Um, so I might have interest in a whole range of things which are linked to the print industry, but which in fact have got their own economic lifestyle, and I may not want people interfering with that. So how do the financial journalists, for instance, on a newspaper, deal with other companies that are linked to, their, to the company that they're working for? Raises some very interesting problems. So in terms of transparency and accountability, these were the sorts of things that the campaign wanted to draw attention to. And we did a huge amount of work in helping people to understand the links between these industries and who really owns um, the newspapers and not just the newspapers. Here in Bristol, for instance, at one time, you had the Daily Mail behind the local paper. They were also behind the sort of electronic news systems that you got on your television in those days. 
what was that called? CFAX. Um, CFAX, etc. They also had shares in the, the local TV company. So without realising it, people were actually, uh, and, and the Western Daily Press, of course, um, and the, the, the Free Weekly Observer. So people weren't aware that much of the stuff they were getting was originated from one source, and that source was not local journalists. It was a news company um, based in London, with uh, uh, owned by people who lived abroad and had their money um, fixed abroad and they weren't even paying British tax. Um, and that makes a big difference when you think about what it is you're supposed to be reading in the papers and who sets the news agenda. Well, I mean, it's like something like Brexit, for example. I wonder whether some of the uh, newspaper owners had a mind to what was going to happen with their tax havens, uh, depending on what the result of the Brexit vote was. Well, far be it from me to say that that would influence what they might have to say about Brexit, but it's pretty clear um, that the the level of hypocrisy amongst those people who own um, our newspapers is uh, hard hard to quantify. Has it been concentrating over the you know, 40 years the CPBF's been around into fewer hands or, well, or is it diversified? Because we've got the Not internet. at all. We've, well, um, there is diversification in the sense that there are, now there are many more local initiatives, for instance, um, and you have to watch out because if you get a successful local initiative, do you remember here in Bristol we had uh, Our School Magazine, for instance, which was a really interesting idea developed by some parents and they sort of created a magazine which would be centred on children's school needs. That was so successful that it got bought up um, by the Evening Post and that uh, before it disappeared altogether. Um, so it's successful bought up local... Bought shut down. Eventually, partly because of the result of a rather bizarre scandal. Um, but the... Um, that, I mean, that's one of the difficulties. If you are able to produce a medium which is successful and is attracting advertising like um, the first um, community radio station here in Bristol, it'll get bought out and changed because it's, uh, it's, it's discovered a niche from which money could be made. And that's the key issue about most media companies. They're about making money, not about the journalism. What about some of the uh, recent cases? Um, uh, we had uh, journalist Mark Watts on here a few weeks ago talking about the Cliff Richard verdict. Um, the BBC, I'm not sure if they've decided whether they want to appeal yet, but uh, this is really effectively saying that even if uh, they're, they're, it's, it's quite true what uh, a newspaper, or in this case the BBC, is saying, in this case about um, uh, Cliff Richard's house being raided, that they're not allowed to report it. I mean, I wonder quite, what you make of that. It's not quite what the... The, the ruling um, said or was about um, and in fact very little has been said about the nurse who was identified as the person um, considered to be at the centre of the deaths at a hospital if you remember um, there were a series of deaths a children's deaths at a hospital um, and several of the newspapers not only named but took, showed published pictures of the nurse who's who was supposed to be involved in this. We don't know. She's never been charged. Um, but as with the, the, the Cliff Richard thing, so far as I was concerned, and I've, I've written about this, um, the big issue there was whether or not the BBC should have hired a helicopter and flown over the property and filmed the police in the property. That was highly sensational. It was unnecessary. It would have been perfectly proper for them to report that the police were going to investigate or to um, search his house, even though no charges had been laid. And if they'd left it there, I don't think they'd have had half the problems that they've got now. It was the intrusive way that they tried to cut out any opposition, any competition, and show that they had sort of snapped this, this, uh, this exclusive um, that was the real problem. I mean, isn't there a bit of a, a problem? A bit of a problem developing, Mike. That uh, that when you're wealthy, it's actually easier to take the press to court. I mean, this is true over libel and things like that. Wealthy people. Uh, are a threat to editors. They they bite their nails. They say, "Oh, should we run this story or not?" If someone's wealthy, whereas if someone's poor, they're you know, forgive the phrase, easy meat for for the tabloids. Yeah, it's. I think it's slightly more complicated than that. It is a fact, though, for instance, that if you live on a council estate, for instance, or in a terrace, your privacy 
uh, is much less easy to protect than if you live in a gated community or behind high walls or indeed if you've got a great deal of money. The libel laws have actually been liberalised in some ways, although the idea of, uh, of, of, of uh, ordinary people being able to use the sort of no win, no fee has changed a bit. Um, but it's always been the case that those people who are wealthy can stop stories appearing. And indeed, I think one of the things that I would like to know more about, um, and when, if we're talking about transparency, is how many cases have there been where newspapers have not run stories because they've been contacted by wealthy solicitors um, or solicitors of wealthy people and persuaded not to run a story. It's much more difficult to do that if you're an ordinary person with no... Um, public standing, if you like. Um, and they're the sort of people that I've been dealing with at MediaWise for the last 25 years. Um, and they get a rough deal and very often have very little chance of um, getting redress. With all your experience of doing this, Mike, are there one or two changes that you'd still like to see, just simple changes that would actually make a big difference? <sighs> well, very complicated, um, really. I mean, I think, I think first of all, it would be a very good idea if there were more transparency about who owns the press. I think that um, organisations such as the the um, so-called independent press standards organisation um, were open, much more open about not only the way it handles complaints, but also having working journalists involved. At the moment, it's sort of. It's a club uh, which does have um, public sector or you know members of the public represented there, but it's still very much an editor's club, um, and it doesn't really provide the opportunity that so many people want to actually talk to people about the issues that have been raised by bad coverage. So you don't have the opportunity for sort of oral hearings, which you used to have once upon a time with the Broadcasting Standards Council, for instance, and that made a huge difference. Um, so that sort of thing, I think, would make a big difference. I think the right of reply shouldn't be a fear for the press. I mean, they have misrepresented Leveson and Leveson's re recommendations. They misrepresented the right of reply, and it shouldn't be a problem, because if you don't get things wrong, if you don't deliberately misrepresent what people say, you wouldn't have to offer people a right of reply. So it's a question of getting things right or as close to right as possible first time and then admitting it when you've got things wrong. And at, at MediaWise, we have a very simple uh, credo. We say that press freedom is a responsibility exercised by journalists on behalf of the public. It doesn't belong to the owners or to the editors. It belongs to the public. And the public have a right to be told when the media get things wrong. And that way we would be able to kill off all this nonsense about fake news. Uh, and if, uh, if our journalists were, how shall we put it, freer to be able to challenge some of the nonsense that both politicians and people like Trump um, um, bellow at us, um, maybe people would have a bit more confidence in the media. And that's the saddest thing, is that you know people have lost confidence in good journalism. Well, it's, a, it's a, in a way a pity you said that today, Mike, because Trump has just been proved right, hasn't he, today? Because there were stories about him arriving 15 minutes late to see the Queen. Uh, everyone, had, um, including the BBC, has had a good look into that, and they found that actually the Queen was 15 minutes early. So... It was, it was no fake news. I have or interest in <laughs> the behaviour of monarchs or Trump when he's visiting them, I'm afraid. Um, I think there are much more serious things to concern ourselves with. I mean, the, the fake news is... I mean, it's, this was really started a uh, year before last at a press conference by... Uh, so I remember Merkel and Obama talking about fake news in the presidential election campaign, in the US presidential election campaign. And uh, that was actually at the same time that Google were doing something. Do you think there's anything real being done about... I mean, what we're talking about effectively is lies you know and it's not just coming out of the internet it's also come out of the press as well with things like weapons of mass destruction before the iraq war well it wasn't the press who who who, um, who talked about weapons of mass destruction that came from politicians don't forget 
and it may have been, it may well be, I think it, it, it is right to say that the press didn't do enough to challenge that. Um, and it is our job as journalists to challenge and to check, especially what politicians say, and especially when, you know, people's lives are at risk. Um, but, I mean, fake news have been around for a very long time. Indeed, the first code of conduct produced for journalists in this country was back in 1884, uh, and it was done by the gentlemen of the press who disliked the yellow press of the, of the day and wanted to show that they were a cut above um, all these people who were writing sensational stories based on court cases, so murders, you know, sex and violence stories in the what we'd call the tabloid, but there were sort of penny dreadfuls. And so they, they set up an organisation which still exists today, the Institute of Journalists, and developed a sort of code of conduct which eventually would be um, changed into the NUJ's code at a later stage. But journalists themselves are the ones who are saying, we've got to make sure that we have some integrity and some ethics about what we do. Unfortunately, a commercial press, with all the pressures that are involved, especially with 24-hour rolling news, what happens is everybody wants to get in on the act, and it's not who's right, it's who's first that seems to be more important. OK, it's uh, crystal ball time, Mike. Um, what with Leveson being only very semi-effective after this horrendous phone, I mean, it was awful, the phone hacking scandal where you've got um, people's answer phones being hacked into, the idea was, oh, we're going to have to uh, get a better press as a result of it. Very little really seems to have changed. What, what's your view of the future? <laughs> Well, I mean, I think for a start, one of the things that's really encouraging is how many local initiatives, like here in Bristol, um, have been developed, partly because the mainstream has been shedding journalists like nobody's business. So we have things like Bristol Cable and um, Bristol 24-7 um, and the Voice Network here, all of which are initiatives from journalists who had been working at the Post. That's a very encouraging development. Um, and, uh, I mean, I'm a little nervous about encouraging the Internet as the only way forward, but uh, it's certainly very interesting to see how direct contact seems to make a difference. But you need a lot more media literacy for people to be able to understand what's happening if they're only getting their um, their news from Instagram or Twitter or Facebook um, or whatever. Um, so I think that uh, the other thing that's interesting is I've been working in Europe with um, other groups of people in about 14 different countries, and there are similar concerns there and similar interests in new types of media initiative, um, which could make hopefully make a big difference. Well, what they're saying, Facebook, people like that, is that, oh, well, in social media now we're taking fake news very seriously. We will have fake news monitors. Yeah, I believe they've got several hundred thousand people um, allegedly checking things, but who these people are and what experience they've got. It's a bit like the fact that local newspapers have, or most many newspapers, have done away with subs. And subs were usually the old hacks whose legs had gone, um, but who knew a thing or two and could look at a story and see whether it really stood up. And they knew the local area and the local streets and some of the local people, so they could really had a, a sort of wise eye over what was being published. Now we find that sub-editing, if it's done at all, is done a long way from where the newspapers are being produced or where the readers are. So all sorts of errors creep in. And I think that, you know, we need to see a lot more investment in proper journalism. Journalism is a career that lots of people want to go in for. I've been teaching it for the last 10 years at UWE, and there's no shortage of students, but there is a shortage of jobs. Um, there are plenty of people who can do the jobs if only the newspapers would actually invest in journalism. I mean, since the demise, uh, many would say, of the unions since, you know, the 1970s, slowly but surely, more and more difficult to keep your job. Do you think that makes a difference when it comes to what journalists write about, whether they can write what they in conscience want to, or whether they're constantly thinking, crikey, if I say this, I might lose my job? Well, I mean, partly it's to do with employment contracts. I mean, a lot of journalists are on short-term contracts, especially in media, 
and that does inhibit their willingness to take risks, for instance, or to cover problematic stories. Certainly the unions have changed dramatically, so all the print unions are now sort of folded into one big um, union which incorporates all sorts of other um, interests too. And that's one of the reasons why the campaign has begun to um, lose money, because you've got lots of, not lots of different members, but one big member, um, and that limits the amount of funds that might be available. <coughs> Excuse me. But the, the positive thing is that there is, there's a whole new generation. I mean, I'm, I'm an old hack. There's a whole new generation of young people, the sort of people who will be at the Byline Festival in a couple of weeks' time, who are seeing the world very differently, who are much more into direct action themselves, who are much more interested in working on both single issues but also seeing the links between different issues. Um, and, you know, at the campaign's um, last AGM, we were talking about the fact that this is, you know, probably the way forward and the campaigning will now be done through those sorts of organisations like Byline and also through um, the fact that the Academy has taken a, a more of an interest in the what's called the sort of political economy of the media and so are able to do the research and produce information which will help people to understand more what's going on. So it's not, it's not that the campaigning's gone, it's just the campaign? The, the, yes, the particular campaign, um, it's a bit like media-wise, it's very, very difficult to get funding. When you've got a lot of publicity around something like the Hacked Off campaign, I mean, that began to sort of drain any financial support that we were able to get. I still um, provide a service for people who are having difficulties with the media, but there's no funding in ethics and... Um, We've also found that there's also no funding in, if you like, political campaigning. It's very interesting, though. There have been five right of reply bills, OK? They didn't come to anything, but it kept the issue alive. And if you look at some of the parliamentary debates, some of the things that were being said 20, 30 years ago are still true now. The only people who don't seem to get the message um, are, the, uh, are the media owners. The, the Campaign for Freedom of Information, which sort of spun off from um, the CPBF, um, has been very effective in getting us um, freedom of information legislation. Article 19, um, promoting freedom of expression, also sort of took on some of the things that the, the campaign was, uh, was working on and has been very effective, not just in this country, but internationally. Um, so, you know, there, there are lots of very positive things that have come out of the work that we've done over the last 40 years. The one anomaly in all of this is the BBC. Do you think they'll survive? <laughs> well, um, it's an interesting beast. Uh, and I think... Uh, I was very interested many years ago, um, although I never belonged to a political party, I was part of a group that helped to produce... Um, a policy for the Labour Party on the BBC Charter. It was a very interesting document, um, which I, I did the final um, edit on. And sometime later, I happened to be involved in discussions at the BBC about something else. And um, somebody, one of the senior executives, started talking to me about some ideas which I thought I recognised. And at the time, I think we were coming up to an election, I can't remember whether it was the 92 election, where there was a possibility of a Labour government. Um, and all of a sudden, these executives were talking around the very issues that was in this document. So they got hold of it, and they were seeing where was the you know, how the writing was on the wall, and so they ought to be in line with what the, the thinking of a potential new government. Of course, that went out the window as soon as Labour didn't win that particular election. Um, and I think that one of the things we've got at the moment is that an anxiety within the BBC about how they do survive, and that means sort of playing along with the prevalent establishment view of what they should be doing. Well, that's, that's easy for them to do, really, with the various chairmen that they've had over the last few years from the well, City of London. Uh, David Clementi, who's the latest chairman of the BBC, uh, former um, from Kleinwort Benson, who were well-known as the big privatisers. Mm. So it does seem to be that the establishment has got 
uh, financial whiz kids running the corporation these days. Well, unfortunately, that's been the case since the Peacock reports back in the 1980s. Uh, and although um, uh, Mr. Burt, who was the director general at one time, had some quite good ideas about the, the, the mission to explain. Um, he also helped uh, to bring in the, this idea of the internal market, which really destroyed the notion of creativity and risk-taking inside the BBC. Well, I'll have to agree with you, because I was there at the time, and nobody liked it, and it completely... Well, basically, we worked around it. Mm. Well, not anymore. No. Um, and whilst I, I, I think it's been quite good that, that independent production um, has become more of a feature of BBC programming, I think that's, you know, it's now become much more a part of it. I think it was once 25%. I think it's a much higher percentage now. Um, and uh, I think all the controversy about the, the cost of talent um, has not done the BBC much good. Um, but it also means that, you know, they really are in a competitive market and, and that, you know, the, the amount of money they can pay becomes the important thing rather than the notion of some sort of public service, which is what it's supposed to be. I hope you're listening, BBC. Anyway, uh, thanks very much, Mike Jempson, for taking us through some of the trials and tribulations of 40 years of the campaign for press and broadcasting freedom. Um, and I guess that you, the easiest way to find out what Mike's been up to is go through the Media Wise website, and that is still... Or follow a, me on Twitter. Or follow Mike on Twitter. <laughs> and uh, if you have, have been maligned by the press, Mike's your man. Getting bigger by being better. The number one choice for Bristol. This is BCFM 93.2.